Hello. Can people come in and take their seats rapidly so that we can start, please? Thank you, everyone. Welcome back, everybody, to the first afternoon. Um, uh, I hope you've had a fantastic first morning. My name is Susan Hopkins, and I'm the Chief Medical Advisor. It's exciting being in a conference in person and meeting all of those people you've only seen on team screens for the first time. I hope you're getting the same brain fizz as I am by hearing the exciting, young, brilliant scientists talk about their science with such engagement. This afternoon, uh, we have a, a presentation that will be televised from Minister Johnson. She's a paediatrician who still works in Peterborough and a parliamentary undersecretary of state at the Department of Health since September 2022. I've already met her and had a very engaging conversation with her about her response to COVID, monkeypox, and many other things, but also highlighting our long-standing work on vaccine-preventable diseases, HIV, hepatitis, elimination, and our work on the National Antimicrobial Resistance Action Plan. I know that she will be, continue to be engaged on the work that we do in the organisation, and I will hand over to hear some of her words. Hello, I'm Dr Caroline Johnson, Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Department of Health and Social Care. I wanted to use this opportunity to thank you all for your work since the UK Health Security Agency was formally created just over a year ago. UK HSA was born in the middle of one of the greatest threats to our health in a generation and it has been a strong shield for the whole nation. Over the past year you have achieved a great deal, helping us to understand and respond to the Omicron variant, respond rapidly to new threats like monkeypox and deal with the thousands of health protection incidents that happen in the UK and abroad every year. You've been making big strides when it comes to innovation too. In my first few weeks in the role, I've been making the case for the importance of open data. And your COVID-19 dashboard, which at one point had over 76 million hits in just 24 hours, has set the standard for all parts of government to follow when it comes to transparency and accessibility. As we move forward, you have an important role to deal with not just the current threats, but the ones that lie around the corner. Whether it is the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, new diseases that are yet to be discovered, or chemical, nuclear and environmental hazards, we will need your expertise as we respond. And the conference today, bringing together people from all parts of health security, provides a fitting opportunity to reflect on how to tackle these threats, taking forward lessons from the COVID pandemic. As with the first year of any organisation, there have been bumps in the road as this important institution has taken shape. But I wanted to say to you all today that I hugely appreciate the work that you all do to protect us and to keep this country safe from harm. Thank you to all of you for the part that you have played and I hope that you enjoy the conference. Thank you, Minister Johnson. So it now gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Sir Chris Whitty to our first UK HSA conference. Chris, with his background in infectious diseases and epidemiology, having worked in clinical practice, uh, worked on malaria in Africa, and worked on the DFID response to Ebola in West Africa, had an excellent background to help lead us through the pandemic response to COVID-19. He has a fierce and rigorous intellect and an amazing ability to lay out the science and the impact of public health interventions to the public and politicians. Personally, I have learned a huge amount um, just observing him in action and learning and how to do the work. We're used to seeing him on TV screens, but today I'm delighted to have him here in person to talk about epidemics, past, present and future. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's great to be back with all of you. I mean, I was until I took up this job uh, a, a, an honorary uh, epidemiologist for uh, predecessor organisations, PHE and HPA, uh, and I very much feel part of uh, one of one of you. Uh, 
So um, this is going to be a canter through, and it's a very simple structure that I use when thinking about pandemics and epidemics. And you can go down to multiple layers. Uh, but I lay this out. You'll all have your own versions, uh, because I think we do need to have a structure whenever you, have, you first address a new problem. And I'd, I've developed this in conversation with Susan, with uh, Jenny, and uh, with the late, great Paul Costford, amongst many others. I think it's important to recognize that when we're dealing with very major epidemics and with pandemics, we have to go back into history. And the reason is these do not happen that often. So whereas some of the fantastic science I was hearing in, for example, the last poster session are very much up to the minute science, much of what we know about epidemics and pandemics goes back a very long way. In fact, most, much of it starts off in plague. Many of the things that we, as professionals, recommended to politicians and to society to respond to the COVID pandemic uh, are in fact, were, in fact, developed in the Middle Ages. They include uh, quarantine, including at borders, uh, isolation, restricting potentially harmful trades. The list is very long, actually. And many of the things that we were recommending would have been recognizable to our forebears uh, uh, several centuries ago. The reason that plague had such a big impact uh, uh, in terms of uh, the way we approach pandemics and epidemics is that it was huge. COVID has been a massive hit to us now, but if you think back to plague, uh, it reduced the population of Europe by somewhere between 30 and 60%. Then uh, almost everybody who studies public health uh, will have studied cholera, and particularly they will have studied the work of John Snow, really the first serious attempt at scientific approach to epidemiology of a pandemic. And again, there's a lot to learn from that, both in terms of the epidemiology that he and others uh, developed, uh, but also in the way that it, it actually uh, was responded to, with societal measures as the initial response, and then moving into medical countermeasures, which in the case of cholera were largely around developing a proper drainage and uh, good water supply system. And the final historical, by which I mean before I was born, example I want to give, uh, was uh, H1N1 1, 1, uh, 1918-19 flu pandemic, which is really the archetype uh, of a modern uh, respiratory pandemic. Uh, before COVID, people had really forgotten this outside professional groups such as in this hall. But actually, if you look back, uh, that pandemic killed, for example, to take US data, more people than the First World War, Second World War, and all the other wars of the last 20th century just in two years. An astonishing impact. Uh, and from this, uh, really, we learned the speed and power of respiratory outbreaks uh, and then pandemics in the modern era uh, with modern communications. So I think. That, what that tells us, of course, is that we will, from time to time, have to deal with pandemics and, more frequently, uh, with major epidemics. And in my view, how we do this depends on five questions. The first is, what is the mortality or severity or virulence of the infection? Depending on that, the response will be very different. Secondly, do we have a treatment available? And if not, are we going to be able to develop it? Third question, do we have a vaccine? And if not, are we going to be able to develop it? Then we have the force of transmission, the R or the R naught initially in the uh, pandemic, uh, which I think uh, the general population now understand better than most doctors understood three years ago. So I think most of you know uh, a lot about that. And finally, and probably most importantly, the root of transmission. Now, mortality from pandemics and epidemics varies hugely. Uh, the first pandemic uh, I and many people in this audience had to deal with was HIV. I was a doctor in Southern Africa where it had an absolutely astonishing toll. Mortality rates were 100%. Everybody who caught it died at that stage. But then we go through to uh, many other pandemics uh, and H1N1 uh, uh, 1918 pandemic and COVID had a much lower mortality, but a very big impact because of the number of people that they affected. So you do need to think about both together. 
And it is also important to realize that this is going to vary by age, which I'll come back to, by nutritional status, by poverty, and many other factors. So just to take the example of measles, uh, measles mortality in the UK is incredibly low, but still happens, and you still get severe neurological damage. It's a very dangerous disease. But in epidemics in Africa, for example, which I've been involved in, mortality is between 5 and 10 percent, so largely because of uh, vitamin A deficiency. When we're thinking about this, it is important, I think a lot of people assume that if something is more transmissible, it will be less virulent. That is not true. There is a fairly loose relationship, and probably in some diseases almost no relationship, between those two variables. And I'm just going to illustrate this with flu. If we can, and I, I have a kind of mental quadrant, in, which is high transmission and high virulence, or high mortality. So you can have a low mortality, high transmission uh, infection, and that would be something like the 2009 H1N1 uh, uh, influenza pandemic, which actually killed fewer people, according to official statistics, than an average seasonal flu year. But it was extraordinarily transmissible. At the other extreme, you've got many of the avian influenzas, and I'll give the example of H7N9, uh, where the mortality rate was about uh, 30%, but very difficult to catch. You pretty well had to do uh, mouth-to-beak resuscitation to a dying swan to achieve it. <laughs> but if you caught it, outcome very poor. The ones which are a real worry are the ones where you've got mortality that is significant and occasionally high, and transmission is high, uh, and obviously uh, the 1918 pandemic and then most recently COVID are examples of those. But I do not think we should kid ourselves. The mortality we've seen in COVID you could easily go significantly higher and still have a very transmissible virus. So I do not think we should assume this is top of the range, uh, catastrophic as for many people as this was. It is also important for us to think about the age structure. So we happen with COVID to have had an age structure where only uh, people uh, who were unlucky had very significant health problems or were older were at particularly high risk, although there was mortality across the whole spectrum. But what would we, would we have done, for example, had the mortality structure been the same as it was in 1918, with substantial mortality in children and non-trivial mortality in young adults? And I think that would have led to a very different societal approach, not just in our initial response, but also in the way that we uh, then uh, went back to a normal society. Would we, for example, uh, have wanted to encourage people to take children back to school? Would we have been able to get people to want to go back to the workplace had it been that structure? And it were it the age structure of HIV, which almost exclusively killed younger adults, that would have led to a different thing again. So it's the mortality, but also the age structure have very big implications. Then on to treatment. Um, uh, this, of course, uh, depends on what we've got available. But in broad terms, you can divide it into specific treatment, antivirals, anti, uh, antibiotics, antiparasitics, uh, and supportive. For most pandemics and new epidemics, we'll probably be relying initially on supportive treatment. And I, I, I'm not going to go into that in detail because this is more of a clinical point. But the one thing I would like to encourage people to remember is in every single epidemic and pandemic I've dealt with, people have prioritized new, whizzy, antibody, new, whizzy, uh, small molecules, and they forget fluids, antibiotics, blood, oxygen, anticoagulation, simple supportive things. Initially, that is what we should concentrate on. If you think about COVID, it was better oxygenation, oxygenation, <laughs> Oxygen, let's just stick there, uh, better, better use of oxygen, uh, anticoagulation, and then uh, steroids, widely available, that really transformed this. Uh, and it was only subsequently that uh, therapeutics uh, came along. Then, of course, get a vaccine. Uh, whenever there is an epidemic or pandemic, the assumption by the general public and by our political leaders will always be, well, just get on and get a vaccine. Well, the last pandemic I dealt with was HIV, the most big one. Uh, and, uh, of course, we still don't have an effective vaccine for HIV after a huge research effort by outstanding scientists. So whilst we have been very fortunate in COVID to get a very effective vaccine very quickly, we cannot make an assumption that that is going to be the case in the future. Sometimes we will have an, a vaccine we can adapt, as in, for example, flu. Sometimes we can just take one off the shelf. 
So, for example, recent outbreaks of, um, of Zaire strain, uh, Ebola uh, virus, uh, but not Sudan as at the moment, uh, or, or yellow fever. Some of them we can develop relatively quickly, like uh, Ebola in the West African pandemic. We knew we had something close to clinical uh, deployment. Uh, but some of, sometimes we simply will not be able to achieve it because the biology isn't there and the many infections for which we do not have vaccines. So we should never promise that to the population because to do so may turn out to be a false prospectus. Force of transmission is the next uh, area. Uh, and again, the degree, the force of transmission and also the doubling or halving time vary enormously between infections. Most uh, of the major pandemics we have actually have quite small forces of transmission, uh, somewhere between one and three, and I've given some examples there. But um, diseases that I've worked on in other contexts, and malaria is a good example of this, uh, the R of malaria in many parts of Africa is above 100. So it is certainly possible to have really high transmission. Why does that matter? Well, the principal reason is you've got to get R below one. And if you've got an R of two, you've just got to halve transmission. If you've got an R of 100, you've got to take it down 100 times. So this has a very big implication for how quickly and indeed how realistically can we actually interrupt uh, a pandemic. But the big one, what I wanted just to spend uh, the final uh, section, but quite a significant section of this talk on, uh, is route of transmission. And I think this is underestimated by uh, colleagues, including medical colleagues, who don't deal with epidemics very much. There are basically five. There are other ways you can get an infection, but in terms of sustaining an epidemic, there are five. This is something which Paul Cosford and I, for example, discussed uh, with uh, Susan and Jenny at some length. Obviously, respiratory. Influenza, COVID, we've seen more recently, uh, SARS. Oral, the classic cholera, but also foodborne, uh, typhoid, uh, which is a bit of both uh, sometimes, uh, and uh, come on to uh, BSC and CJD. Then there are ones which are primarily touch. Lassa and Ebola uh, would be good examples of that. I would have no worry if Susan had Ebola. Well, I would worry for her, but not for me, uh, <laughs> standing here, because this is a touch disease. You actually have to get extraordinarily close. Uh, Vectorborne. Uh, I'd say I'll come on to a major, less major problem in the UK, but still a big threat globally, and sexual and bloodborne, which seem to go together in most of the examples. HIV, obviously the most recent, but syphilis, uh, a big pandemic, for example, when it first started in the 1490s. For most infections, one of them is dominant. If you can get on top of that, you can get on top of the pandemic, particularly if the R is only about one or one to two. Pulling it down below one is possible with a dominant route. A few things, like plague, two are very important. That was vector and respiratory. But mostly it's one dominant. So just running through examples of, of each of these, the point I'm trying to make with these is that the countermeasures are completely different depending on what the route of transmission is. So Ebola. Many of you on this audience worked on Ebola. All of you will have come across the West African Ebola uh, um, epidemic uh, when it happened. Very serious thing, uh, uh, which uh, spread really quite quickly, despite the fact it's relatively difficult uh, to catch. In the case of Ebola, because it's a touch disease, the big risks were in funeral rites when people touched bodies, which were infectious, in hospitals, and then to a lesser extent in society. So the interventions had to be stop people touching dead bodies, really tighten up on infection control in healthcare settings, and then try and keep some kind of physical social distancing, but physical only. You could be quite close to someone, provided you didn't touch them. Very different to where we are uh, at the moment. And by using those systematically, we pull the R below one uh, over time. When I say we, I'm really talking about the West African authorities, but supported by UK uh, staff uh, very much, particularly in Sierra Leone. Uh, and the international community. Uh, despite that, many uh, people died. And at a particular example here, Dr. Uma Khan, who was a remarkable um, clinician and epidemiologist uh, in Sierra Leone. It is important uh, when doing this always to watch the R, not watch the numbers, because the numbers will frighten you. They'll certainly frighten people you deal with. And this is just an example. Uh, if you looked at the Sierra Leonean response, by November of that year, it looked as if the numbers were still going up. 
And my colleagues all turned to us and said, this is clearly not working. Should we stop now? But of course, the R was falling. That's because it's an exponential curve. So it is critical when looking at response, you also look at the R. And the question is, have we got it down below 1? If the answer is yes, we're heading in the right direction. If the answer is no, we have further to go. Then HIV AIDS pandemic, which many of us uh, came into medicine uh, with, um, around 35 million deaths to date. Uh, sadly, more will die from this. Uh, relatively rapid spread, particularly in Africa, but also uh, globally. The point about this one is that uh, the approaches we had to make in the early stages of the pandemic before we had drugs were completely different to what we had to do with, for example, COVID uh, in this time round. They were all around sexual behavior and you people sharing needles. So getting people, start closing schools, getting people to stay at home would have made essentially no difference to HIV, just as the interventions we did use in HIV would have almost no difference when we're talking about COVID. They're completely different approaches because of the route of transmission. Now, in all pandemics, we move from a stage where we go through um, uh, social interventions to try and prevent them through to medical interventions, uh, which are much less damaging. But we should be clear that many of the social interventions are either highly destructive, and we all saw that through the COVID pandemic, or are relatively ineffective. And I'm just going to show you those posters. You can work out which, if any of these, had any impact on people's behavior. Uh, I'm going to particularly point out the one on the right. I don't think that's good messaging, uh, but there are many others. Uh, and what you can actually see is that sometimes changing social behaviors can be extremely difficult when that is all you've got. Fortunately, uh, we have now got drugs for HIV. They've proved highly effective. And without a vaccine, we have still managed to get to a situation where first mortality fell, and now incidence is falling uh, in many parts of the world. It is going too slowly. Uh, there are still very large numbers of people who are being infected who will die from this, uh, particularly in lower and middle income countries. But nevertheless, drugs have led to a medical intervention, which means we now have a path out of the worst ravages of HIV. Uh, and in this country, uh, rates are really going down uh, uh, in a very satisfactory way, but still a long way to go, unfortunately. I'm just going to pause briefly just to go into one a side issue on monkeypox, simply because it's been recent. I know there's been a, a, we, you had a session on that this morning, so I'm not going to go that in detail, just to make the point that if you'd asked me six months ago, how do you deal with monkeypox, I would say this is a touch disease, worry about the very young, the very old, uh, that's the way you're going to intervene on it. What we've now had, it is a touch disease, but it has been spread in uh, Europe and North America almost exclusively uh, in sexual um, inter interactions uh, and among men. And therefore, the interventions we would have thought you needed six months ago, in theory, we've had to change completely to a very different approach uh, to intervening. So you've always got to accept that there may be some shifting around over time. So it remains a touch disease, but with a very different epidemiological pattern. Uh, then vector-borne diseases, not a major threat in terms of epidemics now in the UK, but historically very important. We used to have uh, epidemics of malaria, uh, typhus, plague, obviously the absolute classic, uh, and others. Uh, now we are, being for we are fortunate that we have very few vectors which are, have epidemic potential. Your vectors can pass on infections, for example, Lyme uh, with ticks, but we don't have that risk at this point in time. But we have had historically... Uh, and uh, with midges, in my view, that's probably the biggest risk in some parts of the country. Uh, we don't have midge-borne human diseases, but we do have midge-borne animal diseases like blue tum. I, I still think that's a potential risk. Uh, but uh, it, they are an issue um, in many other areas. Just give the example of uh, Aedes mosquitoes transmit multiple infections. Uh, the most important recent one uh, was Zika, but uh, dengue, uh, for example, yellow fever, for example, uh, all passed on. This is, an inf this is a mosquito species that loves urban spaces. So urbanization, in contrast to some of the other vectors, urbanization has led to an increase uh, in diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases passed on by Aedes rather than a decrease. This, for example, is, an, is spread of uh, dengue in the Americas, uh, and uh, tragically Zika uh, relatively recently uh, a disease that hitchhiked from Uganda in the 1940s through West Africa, South Asia, and then on to Latin America. 
uh, leading to a, an epidemic uh, which caused significant problems with neurological damage of children, which is going to play out, unfortunately, uh, in uh, children as they develop uh, over decades. So the impact of this is uh, really substantial. Uh, why am I concentrating on that? Because if we think about the vexers, here is an area where climate change is going to make an impact. And we're seeing one of the Aedes species, uh, Aedes albopictus, gradually moving up through Europe uh, over the last uh, two decades. And uh, I think we can anticipate it will probably uh, move up at least close to the UK. Uh, and finally, in terms of the routes of transmission, uh, oral. Um, the one area in oral I think we are very much hardened to is waterborne diseases, the classic one, of course, being cholera, due to the outstanding work of our 19th century uh, uh, predecessors. Uh, but that's not true globally, and wherever there is war or disaster, cholera can still follow. We've got a significant outbreak of cholera, for example, in Haiti, started recently, has been a long-term problem with cholera during the war in Yemen, which is absolutely tragic. But here in the UK, we are still potentially at risk from foodborne diseases. And the most recent one, which actually started in the UK, uh, was BSE turning into new variant CJD, uh, which could have been significantly worse than it was. It was still a tragedy for a small number of families. But actually, quite small changes in its epidemiology would have led to a very, very different and potentially tragic outcome. So that's a kind of rattle through the different routes of transmission what you need to do for a foodborne disease is completely different to what you need to do for a respiratory and, again, for a sexual one. So knowing the route of transmission is critical. Finally, uh, on to uh, what do we know on respiratory as a result of our most recent experience with COVID. Well, we knew, for example, we knew before COVID that a pandemic with a respiratory virus uh, was a very significant risk. It's been top of the National Risk Register for some time, with flu being the archetypal one. And your reasons are obvious. Rapid transmission, uh, difficult to interrupt. We had a narrow escape, in a sense, with H1N1 in 2009, swine flu. It was a pandemic, significant transmission, but very low mortality. And I think that may have, to some extent, uh, lulled us into a bit of a false sense of security on this. But pretty clearly, uh, H uh, COVID uh, demonstrates that we had to start again. We had a new infection. And we had to go through each of these, trying to work out the mortality and virulence, work out where the treatments, and they developed over the first six months, work out vaccine availability, fortunately developed uh, very rapidly, uh, force of transmission, and with that is steadily, the, the R0 has steadily increased as uh, COVID has become more transmissible, but the R has gone down largely due to uh, immunity, uh, and the route of transmission, which of course determined what we have to do. So finally, looking forward, what have we learned from COVID? Well, large numbers of people are going to be doing large numbers of things to try and work this out. I will just put out three, but there are very large numbers of things to learn from this. The first one, probably the most important, is the extraordinary priority that the population put on health of other people. Most people who actually went in for social distancing and took huge hits themselves socially, uh, economically, uh, knew that they themselves were at low risk, but they wanted to protect others. So I think that's a very important thing for us to remember. Uh, the second uh, thing is the extraordinary power of science. The swinging around of science towards get drugs, vaccines, proper epidemiology, narrow down the response to this uh, was, I think, uh, very impressive. We have no idea with the next pandemic whether it'll be a vaccine, whether it'll be a drug, or whether it'll be something else completely, but science will always find a way but the third one, which is an old lesson but is worth repeating, is that until science finds a way, we will always have to use social interventions. And they are ineffective relative to medical ones. They are often destructive, and they often go against the grain of normal behavior. And trying to work out how we respond to these is something we should do in advance, because the five routes of transmission are entirely predictable, and we ought to have a countermeasure for each one of them. Finally. As my last point, I really wanted to say an enormous thanks to all of you. The response of uh, PHE, now UKHSA, to the COVID pandemic has been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and I think many people will not realize how much of the response depended on the work that all of you do. 
and it has been uh, you know, something which will have saved many thousands of lives. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. A uh, huge tour de force and a learning lesson for many of us here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed these uh, presentations today. Uh, look forward to hearing lots more and make your way to your next session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>